Just a few facts about breast cancer, and I'm sure you'll all be well aware of this. Breast cancer is the most common cancer diagnosed in women, and is indeed the second most common cause of cancer death in women, lung cancer being the most common still. But the good news is that our survival rate is now over 90% at five years. And that means the vast majority of women diagnosed with cancer will survive their cancer and go on to be long-term survivors with, of course, other potential health issues. In terms of numbers, these are some numbers on the screen of new cases throughout Australia. So this year we're expecting nearly 18,000 new cases of breast cancer, virtually all in women, although around 144 men in, will be diagnosed with breast cancer in Australia this year. And here you can see the incidence by age. And like so many cancers, breast cancer is a disease of aging. And most common, the peak of cancer diagnosis is in women in their 60s. Um, but of course, breast cancer can be diagnosed anytime from the early 20s right up to the 80s or 90s. And I talked about the improving survival. Well, this is just another graph showing mortality from breast cancer. And these are the latest figures from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, which clearly show this falling mortality. Um, this is age standardized rates per 100,000. And I think what this really clearly shows are two things. Probably the biggest cause of this is actually better treatment. But secondly, one cause of falling mortality, a smaller cause, but still an important one, is earlier detection. And I guess that's what we're here to talk about tonight. These are actually some WA figures. These are hot off the press. And in fact, I don't even think are actually uh, published yet. So you've got these first off. Uh, these are diagnosis deaths and relative survival by age of breast cancer in WA in the last uh, cohort that was looked at by the Cancer Registry. Uh, so that's 2010 to 2014. And relative survival is really taking into account all of those competing causes of death in people. And I think what this clearly shows is how well we're doing. So the average relative survival of a woman diagnosed at this time in WA of breast cancer is 92%, um, which means that most women will do very well. And you can see that women in their middle years will do the best. Slightly younger women have a slightly worse survival, probably because they have more aggressive cancers. And interestingly, older women also have a worse relative survival, probably because they have less treatment. I've just put these figures up, and this really just shows you a single institution series. These are some figures, in fact, from Royal Perth Hospital. And this is to demonstrate that for women with very early stage disease, stage naught, which is in situ cancer, and stage one, that is tumors less than two centimeters that haven't traveled to the lymph nodes, have almost 100% recurrence-free survival at five years. So do extremely well. Unfortunately, however, there are still a group of women with more advanced cancers who don't do so well. And what I haven't included in this graph are the women who present with stage four disease, that is disease which is already metastasized to other organs. And in fact, most of those will unfortunately die by five years. So this is just a few things which I'm sure you will remember from medical school about risk factors. Those things we should be putting into our history when we take a history from a woman with a breast symptom. And these are risk factors for which increase our risk of breast cancer. And we've loosely divided these into three groups. All of them, remember, on the whole, only confer a very small increased risk, but it's when you put them all together that they're important. So firstly, the lifestyle factors, and we now know that there's really good evidence that increasing alcohol consumption increases the risk of virtually all cancers, including breast cancer. Overweight and obesity, a really important contribution, albeit a small number, but important contribution to postmenopausal breast cancer, as is physical inactivity. Environmental factors, radiation, and largely that's to do with mantle irradiation in women who've had uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma at a young age. And there may be some occupational factors that are related to an increased risk of breast cancer, but they're less clear and they are only a small contribution. And then there's the biomedical factors. Age, we've already mentioned, age and clearly being a woman are the most important biomedical factors that contribute to a risk. But family history is an important risk. And that's family history, both of those who are about the 1% of population who are likely to carry a known inheritable genetic mutation such as the BRCA1 or 2 mutations, 
but also what we call a polygenic risk factor. So risk factors where you may have a few members of the family who've had breast cancer, but also other risk factors. Putting all of those together will increase your risk. So even having one or two first or second degree relatives with breast cancer will increase your risk a little. And that way you'll have a moderately increased risk of breast cancer. Really importantly, a previous diagnosis diagnosis of either invasive or in situ breast cancer will increase your risk of a second diagnosis. Although I think that's another important factor to consider, certainly me as a surgeon when I'm counselling women, the first thing they often say is, I have breast cancer on one side, please remove both my breasts, then I'll never get breast cancer again. Well of course, removing the contralateral breast doesn't decrease their chance of getting metastatic disease but also the chance of contralateral breast cancer in a woman without a strong family history is only around 0.3% a year, so actually very low. Something that many of you may have heard about is breast density and how that affects the risk of developing breast cancer. And really that's a bit of a double whammy because we know that women who have denser breasts, and that's the white area on a mammogram, have a higher risk of getting breast cancer, but it also makes mammograms much more difficult to read and therefore we have a lower sensitivity of the imaging that we have, either in screening or indeed with symptoms. Exactly why breast density increases the risk of breast cancer, to be honest, we don't yet know. It may be something to do with an increased density of breast cells, but also importantly, we think it's to do with the stromal cells and the actual fibrous element of the breast and possibly some inflammatory factors related to that. We know that breast density is inherited and it's probably something which is actually uh, occurs from an earlier age. In other words, whatever you're, if you have dense breasts when you're a very young woman, you will have relative to your age and relative to your BMI, dense breasts throughout your life. How many people have dense breasts? Well, around 40% of the population will have some degree of breast density but only around 5% of the population will have very dense breasts and therefore an extremely high risk of breast cancer. And that risk is something similar to a family history, perhaps five or six or seven times the baseline risk. Probably this time, this talk is not what we can do about breast density and I know the Cancer Council are hoping to do some more GP education on this next year. We don't, to be honest, know what to do with women with dense breasts, but one Possibility is to discuss not only all of their other risk factors and how they could modify them, but possibly the addition of an ultrasound to their screening mammogram. And finally, risk factors for breast cancer are all those hormonal factors, all the things that make us a woman um, and how long we have menstrual cycles for, including our age of, thank you, I'll have some water, our age of menopause and menarche, but also uh, to an extent exogenous hormones and combined HRT, increases slightly the risk of breast cancer, as does the combined oral contraceptive pill. So just briefly, definitions of what early and advanced breast cancer are. Early breast cancer we refer to as breast cancer that's confined to the breast and or nearby lymph nodes, where there is a curative aim of treatment. And secondary or advanced breast cancer or metastatic breast cancer is cancer that is spread beyond the lymph nodes to other parts of the body. Largely that would be bone, lung, liver and sometimes brain. And although that is largely incurable, fortunately nowadays with better treatment it can often be made a chronic illness. Many women will survive many years, perhaps even their normal lifespan, with low volume uh, metastatic disease. What guides treatment? Well, clearly the pathology guides treatment. So that is factors around the tumour, its size, its surgical margins at removal, whether lymph nodes are involved or not, the grade of the tumour, that is how aggressive it is under the microscope. Importantly, receptors such as oestrogen, progesterone and HER2 receptors. And then there's a kind of tumour where none of those are expressed to triple, triple negative cancer, which is not only an aggressive bad outlook cancer, but we don't have a good target for treatment. But also guiding treatment are, are patient factors. So that's uh, not just the tumour factors, but age, comorbidities, social factors of the patient, perhaps financial and cultural factors. So back to what we're talking about mostly tonight, and that's the signs and symptoms that may best predict breast cancer. Probably the most common symptom that women will present with, and indeed the most common symptom that is concerning for cancer is a lump in the breast or a lump in the axilla. 
and possibly lumpiness generally in the breast, and especially if it's only in one breast. But some breasts have not only a lump but pain, and although there's a common belief that breast pain per se uh, excludes cancer, in fact it doesn't, and we know that some breast cancers, around 5%, will present with both a lump and pain. Importantly, changes in the nipple. In women who get older, changes in the nipple such as nipple retraction, scaliness or changes in the skin of the nipple, nipple inversion or redness can all be an early sign of breast cancer or indeed Paget's disease of the nipple, which is a sign of underlying breast cancer. Nipple discharge, particularly bloodstained nipple discharge and particularly from one duct is always concerning. And a little tip, if you want to know whether that dark discharge is bloodstained, you can always get one of the urine dipsticks and put in it to see if there's blood in there. We've talked about breast pain, that it's not always a sign or often a sign of breast cancer, but it can be, and particularly if it's localised and it's not cyclical throughout the menstrual cycle. And finally, importantly, changing the shape or appearance of the breast. So dimpling, particularly when the patient raises their arms, or a redness of the breast, very important to exclude breast cancer. So this is the, uh, the publication that the Cancer Council have developed, which I think is a really good one actually, which can give you a clue to whether those symptoms that the patient is presenting with may predict breast cancer. Excuse me one minute. And what the Cancer Council have done is they've given you a positive predictive value or a probability of cancer depending on the patient's age, and this is only for women over 40, as breast cancer is pretty unusual under that age, compared to the symptom. So you can clearly see on this chart that a breast lump, for example, in a very young woman, has got a relatively low chance of developing breast cancer, and breast pain, almost zero chance in a very young woman. But in an older woman, in a woman over 70, a breast lump has about 50% chance of being cancer. So this is a very useful chart to refer to, and we'll, we'll have a look at this as we move through the presentation. This is just to explain to you how they came up with the positive predictive value. This was the true positives, in other words, those women who actually had cancer over those who were true positives plus the false positives times 100. In other words, patients with disease over patients with symptoms. And this gives us the probability of cancer for any given symptom, such as pain, lump, nipple discharge, etc. Now, this is probably the most important message that I can give you this evening, and I don't apologise for repeating it time and time again. And that is making sure that any patient who presents with a breast symptom undergoes the triple test to investigate that breast symptom. That triple test includes a clinical examination, it includes the appropriate imaging, which in most cases will be a mammogram and or an ultrasound. We only use an ultrasound only for a woman under 35 or so who, in whom the symptom is very unlikely to be cancer, such as a cyst or a fibroadenoma. Even if you think, if, if you think that woman may have cancer, even if she's only 25, please order a mammogram. And for women over the age of 35 or 40, any breast symptom should probably be investigated with a mammogram, at least if she hasn't had one in the last few months. The third part of the triple test is a biopsy, and that can either be a fine needle aspiration or a core bi biopsy. And certainly if we're suspicious of cancer, a core biopsy is always more useful than an FNA. But the really important part of the triple test is that all three of these things actually correlate and so the implications are that if any part of the triple test is abnormal, the clinical examination, the imaging, or the diagnostic uh, needle biopsy, then the patient does not have a benign diagnosis. You haven't yet made the diagnosis, and that patient needs to be referred to a breast assessment clinic. So to give you an example of that, if the patient has a normal imaging mammogram, a normal ultrasound, and the biopsy comes back as benign, but you're suspicious on clinical examination this may be a cancer, please refer the patient to a breast assessment clinic. And any new breast symptom or sign should be investigated as clinically indicated. 
Now, this just gives you a few implications for practice from that chart of the Cancer Councils looking at nipple retraction in women over 50. So if you look down the chart, really any woman over 50 has, who presents with nipple retraction has some concern that that may be cancer. And that concern rises from only a 2.6% at the age of 50 up to a 12% chance of that nipple retraction being due to cancer at the age of 70. And so you can see from there that it would be very reasonable to investigate all those women and for the women over 70 to refer all of them to a breast assessment clinic. I'll also point you out a new uh, publication that's just come out literally in the last few days from Cancer Australia called Investigation of a New Breast Symptom, a Guide for GPs. And this gives you investigation pathways uh, and, and some guides on what to do. And I'd be very happy if you'd like to download this and keep this in your practice, a very useful guide. And certainly this has also been reviewed by our Breast Surgical Society and we're very happy that this should on the whole um, make sure that all women with concerning symptoms get appropriate investigation. Now just to take you uh, on a different pathway, I wanted to briefly mention breast cancer screening and really just make you aware that that is very different from what we've been talking about, which is investigating a symptom. So the Breast Screen Australia program is, is available for all women between the ages of 50 and 74. They're invited off the electoral register for a free mammogram every two years, or if they have a family history annually. And any woman between the ages of 40 and 75 can receive a free mammogram if they ask for it. But importantly, all women who go for screening should be women who do not have symptoms. So breast screen is not set up to investigate women with breast symptoms. Occasionally in very remote and rural areas of Australia, uh, the breast screening van will allow a woman who has a symptom to have a mammogram through that van because it's the only eligible place. But generally, if a woman has a symptom, she should not go through breast screen. She should go through a diagnostic pathway. But certainly GPs have a very important role to encourage eligible patients to participate in screening. And we'd be delighted if you would increase our participation rate of 56% of breast screen WA by encouraging all women between 50 and 74 to attend every two years for a free mammogram. And I can assure you it's an excellent service. So finally, a few case studies uh, just to get us thinking about what to do. So the first one is a relatively young woman, a 40 year old who presents to your practice with a two centimeter non-tender mass in the upper outer quadrant of her left breast. You do the triple test, in other words, you take a history and examination and she has no family history, no other risk factors apart from the fact that she's nulliparous. And on examination, there's a two centimeter lump in her breast. Can't really tell anything further than that. Now, if we look back at those charts, you can see that for a 40 year old with a lump in the breast, that's less than 5% chance that that lump, fortunately, will be a cancer. But nevertheless, it does require investigation. So what are those investigations? Well, she should have a mammogram and an ultrasound. And in this case, those tests were somewhat suspicious of cancer. She went on to have a core biopsy, quite appropriate for a 40 year old and that could either be done under mammographic or ultrasound control or if it's a large palpable lump could be done freehand and the core pipe secret result comes back as benign benign fibrotic tissue so what are you going to do well this lady has clearly failed the triple test so although the investigation of a core biopsy is benign the mammogram and ultrasound one aspect of the triple test she has failed on and therefore this patient needs to be referred for further investigation and the core biopsy could well be right in the end it could well be a benign condition but it also could have missed the cancer or there could be heterogeneity within the tissue so important to refer this lady to a breast assessment clinic our second case study tonight is an older lady a 69 year old who presents with a few months history of right nipple retraction she has no other symptoms, no lumps, no nipple discharge, and she has no past medical history or history of other breast problems. 
She's a smoker. And when you examine her, she has a slit light retraction with no discharge, no mass. But we go back to our chart and we can see that nipple retraction in a lady of 69, 70, there is around 12% chance that this could be due to cancer. So clearly it needs investigation. The mammogram and the ultrasound are done and they show dilated ducts with debris only. A core biopsy, that shows just some duct inflammation and duct ectasia. This is a rather trickier one, which is why I put this one up, because the most likely diagnosis is indeed ductectasia, perhaps periductal mastitis. This is a lady who is a smoker, where we know periductal mastitis or inflammation within the ducts is quite common. It often presents with this slit-like retraction. But the concern is that she is an older lady with an abnormality, and despite the, 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 the investigations being normal, she has failed the triple test because of her history and therefore she requires a referral for specialist assessment at a breast assessment clinic. So I'm going to stop now and ask for some questions. Uh, I, I know it takes a few minutes for those to come up so while they come up um, we'll just finish, I think we're just finishing uh, the last slide. Here we are, this is the summary slide where all of you think of some questions. So in summary, breast cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in women in this country. Uh, and around 1,500 women will be diagnosed in WA with breast cancer this year alone. We know that early diagnosis improves outcome and that early diagnosis is really down to both patient awareness but also you, the GPs, being aware and investigating and referring appropriately. And so we ask if you can refer all suspected breast cancer to a breast assessment clinic. And we suggest that probably the best thing to do would be to assess, to refer to a breast assessment clinic affiliated with a multidisciplinary team. And if you are going to refer to a surgeon, that, that you refer to a surgeon who is accredited by our Breast Surgical Society, Breast Surgeons. What is the role of MRI in diagnosing breast cancer? Now that's a lovely question, a question very close to my heart because I have a particular interest in MRI having introduced it to this country and got the item number for screening high-risk women. But I'm sorry to say at the moment the government do not in any way support financially MRI for anything apart from screening very high-risk women and so there is no Medicare item number for MRI. MRI however does have a role um, in diagnosing some women who have cancer um, but particularly when the cancer has been diagnosed where there is some difficulty in knowing the size of the cancer because there is discrepancy between the clinical size of the cancer and what we can see on imaging. Um, as I say, it's really, MRI can, uh, for breast, should only be done within a specialist centre um, by a multidisciplinary group of people who have a particular interest in breast cancer and have um, good MRI facilities available with a breast coil and radiologists who know how to read what can be very difficult imaging to read and to understand. We know that MRI is the most sensitive test for looking for breast cancer but it is not necessarily the most specific. In other words there's a lot of false um, false positives and an increased number of biopsies. And as I say at the moment, it's not supported by a Medicare item number. Because I love research, I'll just tell you a little bit about the future of MRI. And we've got some very exciting um, plans for the future of MRI with increasing ability to do something called ultra-fast MRIs, where it only takes three seconds to, to acquire the images. And they're very early images, and therefore you don't see a lot of the benign things. But that's for the future. At the moment, we're stuck with conventional MRI, and it should only be used in super specialist hands, even in women with dense breasts. The only exception, as I say, is screening very high-risk women, but again, that's not available for GPs to order. Those women need to be in part of high-risk surveillance clinics. All right, thank you. We've got two more questions here, um, which I'll read out to you. Uh, what is a woman, oh, a woman has a lump in the breast, but a negative ultrasound and mammogram, doing a core biopsy is then difficult by ultrasound guidance. Do we refer straight to the breast clinic? So that's a good question. So the, uh, the person is asking if we have a palpable lump but normal imaging and therefore that we can't do an image-guided biopsy, 
You've got two choices. You can refer some of PathWest centres, particularly PathWest at Charlie's. We'll do a freehand core biopsy for you. But probably if the woman has a, a breast symptom, a lump, and you can't see anything on imaging, the best thing would probably be, if you're concerned about it, if it's not general lumpiness that's cyclical in nature and she's not very young, to refer her to a breast clinic um, to see whether that needs further assessment. Um, so that's a palpable lump and negative imaging. Uh, secondly, should all women with increased density on breast screen mammograms have an ultrasound ordered or only if guided by clinical examination? An excellent question. The first thing to say is that breast density is a mammographic appearance and it doesn't always correlate with how the breasts feel. So we know we've always all felt those what we think are very dense, lumpy breasts. They're often dense breasts on mammograms, but not always. So that's not breast density is a mammographic appearance, not a clinical thing. So the question is, should you always order an ultrasound with dense breasts? That's a very difficult thing to answer because how de breast density is recorded is very variable. And the breast density letter that women get through breast screen is really just the radiologist assessing visually the mammogram to radiologists and assessing whether it's dense. We know probably the best way to measure breast density is using various computer algorithms that can be read on digital mammograms, but most places don't have those, they're expensive breast screen don't have those. So breast density is a variable feast. I think if you're concerned, my advice would be to assess all of the risk factors of the patient. And if they have breast, sorry, dense breasts and other risk factors, then it would be worth considering adding an ultrasound in. But of course, that's not done through breast screen and they will have to pay for that if they're otherwise asymptomatic and you want it done in screening. Get more bits of paper. I love this. This is great technology. Um, next, are there any circumstances where we do not need to complete the triple test, say history and imaging and not biopsy, in an investigation of a breast lump? That's a very good question. And I think probably the commonest scenario that comes up is a very young woman who presents with a palpable, mobile breast lump that she really think is either a fibroadenoma, for example, or a cyst. Um, and you could just perhaps clinically watch that. I think it would be reasonable if it was something which changed with the cycle to watch it and not worry too much about it. But if she has a persistent and new breast lump, um, then even in a very young woman, I would do an ultrasound. If the ultrasound very clearly shows that it's either a cyst um, or lumpy normal breast tissue, then no, she doesn't need a biopsy. But if she has a distinct lump, I think that does need a biopsy, at least an FNA, not a core. Because of course, fibroadenomas are usually benign. You often don't need to do anything about them. But there is a differential diagnosis of something called a Fallodes tumor. So I think even with a patient you think it's a fibroadenoma and they're 25, it's worth putting it to bed, knowing that it's a benign fibroadenoma by doing the triple test. And then she probably doesn't need any other treatment if it doesn't bother her. And question number four, what is your recommendation for screening asymptomatic women with very dense breasts? Well, we've already had that discussion really. And I guess the only addition at the moment that we have is consider adding an ultrasound every two years to their mammogram. But there's not a lot of evidence behind that at the moment. And to be honest, we're still very early days in our research around what to do. For breast cancer patients post-treatment, who undergoes mammogram yearly but has breast cancer, do they need ultrasound as well? Another excellent question. So for a woman who's had breast cancer and still has her breasts, yes, she does need annual mammography. And that can be done if she was diagnosed through breast screen. Breast screen WA are very happy to do that through them, or it can be done elsewhere. Um, does she need an ultrasound? If she had, uh, this is usually something that the treating team will give her advice on. If she had a, a, um, a, a, a cancer that was quite difficult to diagnose initially on mammogram, uh, or if she has dense breasts, then probably adding an ultrasound in is a good idea. And occasionally, for some women um, within our specialist centres, we might add an MRI on as well. But certainly the baseline would be an annual mammogram for the rest of her life.